Humans have been mining metals and minerals for thousands of years. These days, though, it's more for smartphones and solar panels than cookware and coins. Vast quantities are needed for the global energy transition alone, as well as consumer electronics and the booming digital transformation at large. Critical minerals like lithium, cobalt, nickel, copper and rare earth elements are essential for not only renewable energy products like wind turbines and EV batteries, but the infrastructure and systems needed to power them. Hello, and welcome to the first episode in our Circling Back series of the Circular Economy Show. I'm Emma Elabade, and over the next five weeks, we're revisiting some key conversations from our archive that feel especially relevant right now. To start, we're bringing together two top-of-mind topics, the scramble for critical minerals and how circular economy strategies can help us secure and stabilise their supply. Some scenarios suggest we'll need five times more of these minerals by 2040. And that makes designing out waste and keeping them in use for as long as possible more important than ever. In this episode, Seb talks to Ke Wang from the World Resources Institute about why the circular economy is central in the energy transition, how economics and competitiveness are driving that transition, and examples of where that is already happening in practice. Kerr, thank you so much for joining us on the Circular Economy show. I actually wanted to start by asking, how did you get into the circular economy? What's your kind of circular economy origin story, as it were? Yeah, thank you for having me here, Seb. I actually started working on the circular economy almost 10 years ago. And before that, I was a physicist. So it had nothing to do with environmental circularity. And actually... um, why did I make such a sharp turn in my career? I was actually, I got largely inspired by what Ellen MacArthur Foundation was doing. Uh, I was fascinated by the idea that we could potentially have an environmental and economic win-win. So I, I really changed my career path. And yeah, since then I've worked on a wide range of topics in circularity and the recent two years focusing on critical minerals. But EMF always has, have a special place in my heart. So really happy to be on the show. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear that. And um, and I guess that brings us to the topic of this episode, which is what is it about the topic of critical materials, minerals? Um, I guess that links very close to energy transition. What's the connection there to circular economy? Why is circular economy so important? Right. So I guess we all know that in order to reach the climate goals, an important part is transition to cleaner energy. And although the clean energy transition reduces our dependence on fossil fuel, but it does need a lot of minerals because all the technologies, whether it's electric vehicles or solar panels, wind turbines, the grid, they're all very mineral intensive. So we all know that EVs tend to be heavier than conventional cars. That's because it requires a large battery, right? So on average, an EV requires six times more minerals um, than a conventional car. And the International Energy Agency has forecasted that to meet the climate goals, we'll need four to six times more minerals um, by 2040. So that's a, that's a huge increase. And is that just well, because of the batteries? Sorry to interrupt, Chris. Is that just the batteries because they're so material intensive, or is it is there a kind of wider set of material needs that come with that infrastructure? It's wider. Um, batteries from EV is a major driver, but also solar panels, wind turbines, and the grid. You know, so all the transmission network um, they all need a lot of minerals. I'm sorry, I interrupted um, you and you were basically saying like there's a lot of material needs that come from this energy transition that's happening. Indeed, indeed. And it's not only the energy transition itself, right? Many other sectors in the society also need uh, digitization, need a lot of minerals. Uh, building environment, building houses, infrastructure need a lot. And the newly emerging defense industry will also need a lot of metals and minerals. So. Yeah, clean energy is one of the drivers, but not the only driver. And I guess one option there is, I mean, or, or where that almost 
um, I'm going to say one option, it's not really an option, but where, the risk of that is it takes us to a place of simply extracting those materials out of the ground at massive, massive scales, many of them being finite, the cost effects of that. Um, when, we were, when we've talked about this topic before, Co, we've talked about it being really fundamentally driven by the economics. Like This is an area where, yes, there's an environmental case for um, better designing or thinking about how these materials are recaptured and remanufactured and recycled and so on. But there's also really a very clear economic case. I wonder if you could say what makes the economic case for using circular economy um, models, designs, thinking in this sector specifically or this collection of sectors specifically? Sure. Maybe if I can first respond to something you said in your, in your question, you said it's finite. Uh, I think that's a very natural reaction, right? People will be wondering, do we have enough? Um, and actually, we do have enough. There's enough of these mineral resources under the Earth's crust, both on land and in oceans. So actually, finite supply is not a major concern. And you might say, okay, what, what are the major concerns then? Um, is one is because we'll need new mining. We do need new mining. Even if we're perfectly circular, we'll still need more new mines. And mining is known to have a long history of causing environmental and social harms uh, at the local level. So while we try to solve the climate challenge globally, are we gonna actually do more harm at the local level, right? That is one concern. The other concern is conflict because natural resources have always been a major cause of human conflicts. We've seen that in oil and gas, water, etc. And now mineral supply is seen as a national security issue, right? Not just for energy, but also for defense, for digitization. So countries are worried whether they can secure enough supply for themselves, right? So there's really a risk that intensifies geopolitical tension and the conflict. So the, the the concern or the challenge is can we meet the world's need for all these minerals, both in time and in ways that's protecting people and nature. So that's a big challenge. And I'll come to your, your main question about you know, what is circularity's role in it, especially from an economic sense, is that circularity can help manage demand, right? That's the principle of circularity is that we can meet all these demand while reducing the dependency on virgin materials on mining. So that, of course, has its environmental benefits, less new mining, less pollution, less forest loss, etc. Uh, and it also has the economic, this kind of security concern, right? So for countries, especially countries that does not have a lot of mineral resources themselves, circularity can provide a source of supply, which can help with security, with supply resilience that is very high on the political agenda nowadays. And I think we can come back to some of the, um, well, an example of where that shift's really pervasive right now in the EU, but I wonder if we could just dwell for a moment on kind of an example of what that looks like. I know you've done quite a bit of work on recycled copper, for instance. So how mm. does that, um, how does this kind of circular economy opportunity actually get realized um, in across the kind of EVs or electrification or digitization or energy transition space? What does it actually look like um, for a material or a specific product? Yeah, so we can apply the, the circular economy framework, right, to, to, to energy, to EV, for example. Then, you know, all these different R's at a reduced level, you can think about uh, smaller EVs. EVs are getting bigger and bigger. Bigger EVs need a bigger battery and more minerals. So by reducing or right-sizing of EV, um, then we'll, that can reduce global demand for minerals. You can think about reuse, like when batteries retire from EV, they, are still, they still have capacity. They have 70% of the capacity left in them. So instead of treating them as waste, they could get a second life as storage batteries connecting to solar panel, for example. And then recycle. That's something everybody agrees that battery recycling will be will be critical. So then, you know, we are indeed looking to copper recycling. You might ask why. It sounds so old-fashioned. Um, it's because we really think copper is a sweet spot where circular, circularity can demonstrate and deliver short-term benefits um, for the critical minerals challenge. And why is that? Um, first of all, is because the demand trend is robust, 
right? Copper, we currently produce and use about 25 million tons a year, and it's forecasted to grow to 40 million tons by 2050, which is a huge growth. And um, that's because copper is needed by all the clean energy technologies I mentioned, whether it's EV, solar panel, wind turbine, grid, they all need a lot of copper. And it's also needed by other sectors, right? Building environment or um, electronics. So the demand is robust and it's harder to substitute. That's why uh, both Europe and the US, as well as many other countries have listed copper as a strategic material because you know it's important for the economy. We've always needed and then, copper and we always will need it by the sounds of it. <laughs> we have, right, it has been thousands of years, right? So coming to, yeah, so humans have been mining copper for thousands of years and so the easy ones are gone already, right? We do have more copper underground, but the the ore grade, so the concentration of copper in these rocks are so low, it's often well below 1%. So new mines are possible, but the economic viability is, is reducing and also produce a lot, of, a lot of waste, right? Because of concentration so low. Um, so ramping up the primary supply is possible, but it's challenging also. Then the third reason is because copper is already abundant in today's waste stream, right? When people talk about battery recycling, they tend to say, yes, it's important, but it's going to be important in 10 years from now because we don't have much waste batteries yet. They're just being installed. (laughs) Yeah, they're just being, right. But for copper, we do have lots of them. We have lots of them from all kinds of waste, whether it's electronics or building materials or or vehicles. We we have loads of that already. So the, oppo- the opportunity is already today. Um, and there are modeling results saying, okay, if we do increase a global copper recycling rate, we can get 6 million tons more every year from landfills. Right. So it's a lot of avoided mining, avoided waste, avoided water usage. Yeah. So copper is, a, is an example of a material flow where there's an opportunity today, as, as you just described, and really good reasons for that. What you also mentioned earlier was um, some of the political and security issues related to critical raw materials. And even if someone's keeping it like a kind of cursory um like glance at the news now they'll be somewhat aware of of the things that are being talked about in that space perhaps one example that received less like mainstream media attention but is really interesting is the european commission's clean industrial deal where decarbonization competitiveness and indeed increasing circular material use were all put at the heart of are now very much at the heart of the European Commission strategy. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about that as an evolution of previous Circle Economy Acts. What does that say about the direction of travel for Circle Economy um, and the, and in particular in the European Union context? Yeah, I think indeed. I think that that is in a illustration of, you know, how circularity in the critical minerals topic um, has gone beyond the environmental uh concern, right? It is really a political and economic concern. It is shown by, uh, as you said, EU's newly released Clean Clean Industry Act, as well as the Critical Raw Material Act that was uh, approved last year. They are both led by DG Grow, right? So for people not (laughs) so familiar with with, uh, the EU jargons, DG Grow is equivalent to Ministry of industry or Ministry of Economic Affairs, right? Well, compared to conventionally circular economy is usually led by the Ministry of Environment or DG Environment, and it tends to to show up in environmental legislations. But this time it's, that means it's getting a broader supporter base um, in the government, which is always good, right? So uh, I think both environmental uh, motivations and economic motivations are important. The more motivation there is to go circular, the better, right? Because um, because there are more more supporters. And the more those things, I guess, overlap, the more you know, the more again, the more prioritization, the more reasons, the more energy Absolutely. momentum. 
Yeah, indeed. I think I think like you know, NGOs as NGOs sometimes we tend to get caught up on on motivation, right? Like sometimes people will say, "Oh, but they are what they're wanting circular economy for the wrong reason." Um, I personally think we don't need to align on motivations and and the beliefs. If we all want the same thing to happen, that's good, right? It's just like eating more vegetables. Some people may do that for animal welfare. Some people may do that to、uh, for climate、uh, change, and others do that for personal health reasons. They're all good as long as you know the net result is is we're eating more vegetables and less meat. And what does it tangibly? Uh, and, and I know there's a degree of forecasting that I'm asking you to do in this answer, because so you can only speculate to some degree. But what do you think that tangent, that circle coming being at such, being at the heart of such a kind of implementation act, if you like, because of the the scale of it and the scope of it and the impact it can have? What does that What does that mean in projecting forward for the? Circular economy, and and in particular for ha- you know, what are some of the things that might happen as a result of that act being in place? Yeah, I think、uh, as a result, recycling、uh, industry will will get a boost because like every country sees recycling as a integral part to to secure this mineral supply, right? So we see both both US and EU are really having supportive incentives. Um, for to to grow domestic recycling capacity, which which is good because much of the legislation framework or the ecosystem, the infrastructure,、um, can benefit other sectors as well, right? So if we start with metal, start with battery minerals, then we'll build the ecosystem, which will help us to be more ready.、Um, When the solar panels, you know, come to end of life, when the batteries come to end of life, but also benefiting electronics and and、um, the circularity more broadly. So I think that's that's good news.、Um, the higher R strategies, so the reduce and reuse, tend to be always a bit harder than recycle. Right, so、uh, that's also what where we see in policy support. It's there's a lot more focus and consensus on recycling,、uh, but the but the the other reduce and reuse realm is、uh, still like less touched. And I guess that、so、there's untapped there's, potential. Yeah, and there's there's a natural journey there as well that、um, both governments and and in the world of. Private sector of businesses go on of starting with、um, you know circular economy at one stage as, as you just described was really locked in a kind of waste management、um, bubble even within policy making so the fact that it's、um, even if it is through the lens of、um, a, you know heavy focus on recycling is in this kind of economic competitiveness part of policy making it's a really helpful and step forward and platform to explore some of those further opportunities. Yeah, there are some of the classic kind of trade-offs in in the circular economy world, which is probably very familiar to your to your audience. Is that there's also trade-off between recycle and reuse, right? We've seen it happen in other sectors when there's too much focus on increasing recycling, it's cannibalizing what could be reused, right? So you know, still perfectly functional products will get pushed into recycling if we're Only pursuing a high recycling rate,、um, so that's that's a a balance、uh, that that needs to be maintained. Lots more work for you to do, then, Ker. I guess as a as a as a result of that, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today, and I'm sure we'll speak to you again soon. As the rollout of renewable energy scales at pace, e-waste continues to increase, and the first generation of EV batteries and wind turbines start to reach the end of their lives. We have a window of opportunity to build a better system based on the principles of a circular economy. By designing circularity into the rapid and material-intensive electrification of everything, we can supply and support the transition in ways that reduce volatility, capture untapped value, and build more resilient supply chains. Interested to learn more? You can dig deeper into how the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is driving a circular economy for critical minerals over on our website. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with another trip through the archive. Don't miss it.